2021 marked a turning point in agriculture, fisheries, food security, and rural development in St. Lucia. The sector, having navigated through public health and socio-economic uncertainty, did register significant changes in its overall output. However, despite the storms which challenged the industry's growth cycle, the Agriculture Ministry remained rooted in its commitment to bolster the agriculture economy through projects, activities, and partnerships that address the changing needs of its constituents. This is the Agriculture Sector Year-End Review. We take a look back now at our major achievements for 2021. I am Amanda Faye Clark. Welcome. Agriculture stakeholders continued to make steady strides in addressing climate impacts on the sector, this time through a regional virtual conference on climate smart agriculture. The conference on climate smart agriculture, building sustainability and resilience in agriculture, sought to bring about interactive discussions on various aspects of agriculture crop production in an era where the regional agriculture industry struggles to thrive amidst a myriad of climate-related variabilities such as prolonged drought, damaging hurricanes and tropical storms, and extensive flooding. The event, organized by the Taiwan ICDA through the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, a facility established to train development practitioners in 2015, saw submissions by the Foreign Agriculture Service of the United States Department of Agriculture, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, AICA, and the Ministry of Agriculture of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. It also explored topics such as utilizing weather data and innovative site-specific techniques to step up agriculture production and resilience, and systemizing climate action in Caribbean agriculture. I think to tackle the impact of climate change is a continued uh, process and uh, I think a long, long-term uh, effort. So um, the older uh, uh, project or all the cooperation that we're dealing with uh, Ministry of Agriculture all have this uh, component. Uh, for example, in uh, PBIP we have the irrigation system. We introduced the Taiwanese uh, variant of uh, banana. So that's all part of the uh, measures that we're dealing with the impact and also including the uh, hoop uh, greenhouse of our uh, Seven Cross project. So all of that, uh, all uh, including in uh, the uh, way that we, how, to, how we uh, tackle this impact of uh, climate change. In St. Lucia, the Banana Productivity Improvement Project, the BPIP, and the Seven Crops Project are examples of interventions on the ground in which climate smart agriculture concepts are readily incorporated. The new curve in strategizing the way forward on crop production in St. Lucia will see more roundtable events where practitioners from different sectors can come together to collectively discuss climate impact issues on the sector ahead of implementing agriculture projects and programs in the future. For agriculture leaders, initiatives must be uniquely tailored to assist farmers in sustaining their overall output. We have introduced the hoop greenhouses, we have introduced weather stations, we have introduced simple basic technologies such as irrigation, and we plan to continue uh, mitigating against climate change. As you know, right now, we are in the rainy season and we have more dry season weather out there. So we understand that, um, that drought is a serious issue, that flooding is a serious issue, and that these are direct um, um, impacts of climate change, on, uh, climate change sorry, on our system. So we do continue to explore the appropriate technologies and we continue to assist the farmers in um, accessing capacity building in terms of their training and also introducing them to new technology where they could um, mitigate against the climate change. The water and sewage company Wasco completed works under the first phase of the John Compton Dam Desilton project. This period of work saw the removal of sediments around the dam wall to clear the lower abstraction port. The overall aim was to increase the plant's water reserve capacity after 400 million gallons of water was displaced after accumulating over 1.7 million cubic meters of silt over the years, which can be attributed to the passage of hurricanes and tropical storms. I mean, it was very challenging, and like we just said a while ago, we have no control over the weather. And when we gave a contract 
to do the construction of the settlement disposable area. We targeted it to, to coincide with the dry season. Unfortunately, that year, it was not a traditional dry season. It was a rainy season and with the, the contractor, unfortunately, lost almost a, a one year of, of, of dung time as, as it pertains to the impact of the, of the rain that affected the dredging. But I'm, I'm, I must say, it's something new to us in the region. Um, and we have learned from the experience. Um, and we were able to accomplish it because there have been talk from since Thomas 2010 as far as dredging the, the John Compton Dam. As mitigating the effects of climate change on the agriculture and fisheries industry remained a top agenda item for the administration of the Ministry of Agriculture, the partnership between the Department of Fisheries, the Global Environment Facility, Jeff, and the CC for Fish project saw the handover of a variety of equipment to the Marine Unit of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, including water pumps, charts, navigation systems, and maintenance tools. The procurement of equipment is in keeping with the mandate of the CC4 Fish Project to increase resilience and reduce vulnerability to climate change impacts in the Eastern Caribbean fisheries sector. The exchange deepened collaborative efforts between the Department of Fisheries and the Marine Unit as it will be of great benefit to all stakeholders involved in the fisheries sector. Having had the impact of ELSA and such other immense and unpredictable events, we know how critical it is to build resilience. And the fisheries sector, like any other sector in St. Lucia, is one that is extremely vulnerable. So providing information and providing equipment to the police marine unit that aids in the efficiency of the operation and aids in the search and rescue operations especially is critical. It enhances the probability of, a, of success in these rescue operations and also it saves lives, lives of the persons at sea and also those performing the rescue operations. So critical in enhancing the other operations, the equipment will be handing over today. In an effort to combat the cocoa sector's low levels of production and productivity, the ministry launched the Cocoa Sector Enhancement Project, which is geared towards the rehabilitation of cocoa farm holdings. Some of the activities included transplanting unproductive plants and increasing acreages of cocoa on the island, all in the hope of increasing cocoa bean production while improving the subsector resilience to climate change, addressing most common diseases that impact cocoa plants and low market penetration. Under the project, farmers are given the opportunity to sign a memorandum of understanding, which would facilitate the collection of data including the status of cocoa plants, production, sale of cocoa beans, as well as prices of the produce. Basically what that project stands to do is to um, revitalize and expand the cocoa um, subsector. A number of initiatives has been um, targeted, such as um, propagation of seedlings for farmers. Currently, we have on offer cocoa seedlings for farmers at a further subsidized price of $2. Before it was $4, right now we are selling these seedlings at $2 per plant for farmers just to encourage them to um, increase the acreage of um, cocoa on the island. The St. Lucia Marketing Board continued its efforts to stimulate, facilitate and improve the production of marketing of fresh local agricultural produce. With the assistance of the Agriculture Ministry and the Taiwan Technical Mission, 10 additional farmers were added onto the contractual arrangement launched in 2020. After the completion of a six-month trial period, where the first 20 farmers steadily supplied a variety of crops to the establishment for that cycle. The purchase agreement is strategic in its design to ensure a consistent supply of local produce throughout the year, including the seven crops targeted under the Seven Crops Project, and is aimed at deepening the relationship between the St. Lucia Marketing Board and local farmers, resulting in a more effective food marketing plan. And I believe that if we continue this trend, um, all we, the, the hope of the marketing board uh, basically is to ensure that we have as many of the farmers participating in, in programs like that or, or deal, working with the marketing board rather than having to be all over St. Lucia looking for, for, for market. It's the hope of the marketing board that maybe 80-90% um, of our farmers would have this kind of arrangements with the marketing board, which makes it a lot easier, not only for the farmers, 
because you have one stop where you can bring in your produce, but also the consumers, because we would be in a position to process this, this, these crops and make it a product that is probably superior to what is available on the, on the market. In fulfilling its vision of ensuring sustainable food supply and food safety standards for every citizen, the Agriculture Ministry convened a series of training for farmers and food handlers alike in safe food handling and good agricultural practices. The former agenda item saw the welcoming of new certified farmers into the fold after a five-week training program for agricultural regions 1, 2 and 7 which exposed farmers to updated agricultural practices that are likely to improve farming processes. The farmer training, which also focused on pesticide use and cultivation management, post-harvest technologies, record keeping and marketing, and business planning, were replicated in other agricultural regions. With education and attitude, perhaps you can get to good agricultural practices. But if you want to distinguish yourself, I say you have to get to great agricultural practices. You have to put a capital GG on that. So you have to distinguish yourself and take that and learn. You have to evolve as a farmer, evolve as a businessman, evolve as a person if you want to succeed and have a premium product in this market to distinguish yourself and to add value to what you produce. 17 retail and pack house staff of the Sindusha Marketing Board graduated from a practical training exercise on post-harvest handling and food safety of fresh produce for marketing. The training was one of the outputs of the Seven Crops project. Farmers of Region 2 are better able to manage the post-harvest handling process of lettuce. This as the Seven Crops Project, under the guidance of the Taiwan Technical Mission, convened a training which also introduced new lettuce varieties to farmers, namely the green and red rapid lettuce and the green and red romaine lettuce. The justification for this intervention is to ensure crop quality, minimize loss, provide better options, longer lasting and high value produce to the consumer. We find a lot of issues with when people harvest and how they treat the lettuce. Sometimes we get wilting because they do not understand that those things should not be exposed to heat. So sometimes they come in to deliver, but they have over there to go and there to go and they'll do all of that, not noticing that the nylon, the lettuce is in, and we try to advise them not to put it in nylon, nylons, but the reality is sometimes it do happen. But by the time they get there, you get a lot of wilting, you get a lot of water loss. Now we now, what we buy, we could never sell because of that natural environment. You could never sell what you buy, especially a product like lettuce. When we buy it, it's full of water. By the time you know the guys take it to it, storage area, you have some water loss already. So if you have to go back and weigh that lettuce later, it will not weigh the same. You know, so um, we want farmers to understand that there are certain things that they must do when it comes to post-harvest, when it comes to dealing with leafy vegetables, right? Once they fail to do that, those products go to waste. Extension and advisory officers also benefited from the training series facilitated by the Seven Crops Project this year. For them, it was introductory sessions on the installation and maintenance of group greenhouses, one of the highly sought-after agricultural technologies in recent years. We did one year of trials with the hoop greenhouses, that's what we're talking about, that's what we're seeing here today. And um, we observed that um, it was very encouraging. The quality and the quantity of the fruit was way better under the hoop greenhouses throughout. So we tried it in, in all the regions throughout the island in several different microclimates. And out of that, we realized that we did have some issues. Like anything, it's a new technology to our environment. So that is what we call adoption. So we adopted the technology wholesale as it was in Taiwan. And um, after that first year of trial, we realized that we have to tweak it a bit. So today we have, um, we come in here today, we are here to show the extension officers the necessary adjustment that we, we have seen fit. As St. Lucia continues to build its resilience against pest introductions, a core of plant health practitioners got an opportunity to augment their professional capacity through their successful completion of training on economically important plant parasitic nematodes. It was a collaborative output of the Ministry of Agriculture, the University of Florida, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, 
and the Caribbean Health Directors Forum as a proactive undertaking to equip plant health officers with basic diagnostic and surveillance techniques for nematodes. Nematodes can be described as microscopic soil pests that affect plants, and these incursions frequently threaten economic development, natural resources, and the environment. We are confident that this training will enhance the food security in St. Lucia, as many of our major crops are susceptible to nematodes infestations. For example, the banana industry, which is our main export crop, has over the years battled with several species of nematodes, causing topplings and reduction in yields. Fruits and vegetable production have also been affected, both in open fields and protective structures. With the advent of globalization, it must be noted that trade in agriculture commodities have over the years increased our vulnerability to new pests and diseases, including nematodes. Timely identification and management of such is therefore critical in not only improving crop yield but also implementing good agricultural practices to minimize or eliminate the use of synthetic pesticides. The Department of Agriculture joined the rest of the globe in commemorating World Food Safety Day 2021 where observances held under the theme Safe Food Today for a Healthy Tomorrow was aimed at keeping food safety concerns on the public agenda. In St. Lucia, agriculture and food safety leaders endeavored to provide opportunities to constituents of the agri-food sector to learn and discuss on the myriad of ways to guarantee that the food we consume is safe in the hopes of reducing the number of people who get sick from eating unsafe food. We want to take this opportunity to reach out to our agro-processors and let them know that and we, we, we want you to know agro-processors that we now have on board a new component to ensure that the food that you are processing meets all the standards, the requirements for the markets that, do, that, that they're destined for. So they will now have on board a food technologist. Very soon we'll be bringing in a food safety specialist and they are there to ensure that they can help you improve your product. Food safety is a critical component of the newly relaunched National School Feeding Program. Partly sponsored by the Food and Agriculture Organization, activities under the program will begin to address the knowledge gaps in food safety awareness and education among all involved in feeding our school-aged children nutritious, safe meals. Last year, we conducted an assessment of all the school kitchens and gardens in St. Lucia where food safety is concerned. So we looked at the, 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 the kitchens holistically. We looked at um, storage. We looked at their water quality. We looked at everything where food safety is concerned. Also, um, the FAO, we're working very hard with, with the cooks, training them in food safety and quality. We're also including parents and students in this program because we know, of course, um, our children are very, very important where food safety is concerned because you know sometimes they could take that, um, they could disregard, disregard the whole food safety issue. Hurricane Elsa served the agriculture industry another devastating blow which compounded the sector's slow recovery efforts as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In assessing what later totaled more than $34 million in losses and damages on the various holdings in extension and advisory services, such as the Fisheries Department, Livestock and Crop Extension Divisions, banana and planting farmers suffered the most with reported losses of 80% or more of their farms. We're looking in the region of 2,400 acres to 2,800 acres affected and over 600 farmers affected by that in that sector. We also saw to a certain extent um, drop fruit trees, root crops, vegetables were also affected in the crop extension area. In terms of fisheries, we saw that there were some damaged vessels by the Denry area um, minimal losses though. We also saw CMOS farmers in the areas of Poile became affected, uh, the headline losses of CMOS. In the area of livestock division, we saw about 70% damage to sheds, animal sheds. We saw some mortalities 
in terms of swine, poultry, in the livestock sector. Um, so these areas have been affected. In terms of forestry, we saw some slides in the forest reserve. Also, you would have noticed that there would have been some fallen trees and some damaged trees in that area. Recovery assistance came in quick timing from the Banana Productivity and Improvement Project, the BPIP, to help banana farmers as they continue to battle against the many other challenges impeding their productivity, namely the COVID-19 pandemic, natural disasters and severe weather conditions, and extended dry spells. We continue to support the Banana Productivity Improving Project and Taiwan is committed to providing reliable assistance and incorporating new and innovation technologies to St. Lucia's agricultural industry. I have, the privilege, I have the privilege to accompany Minister Prosper to visit the Taiwan Technical Mission headquarters right after Minister assumed his post and learn about his vision of future agricultural development in St. Lucia. I believe through our agricultural cooperation, Taiwan and St. Lucia will be able to join hands to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2.3 to increase agricultural production and the income of food producers. The BPIP is known for its facilitation of activities to increase farmer productivity and efforts to revitalize the banana industry in St. Lucia. All these actions are strategically done to restore farmer confidence. With the severe and almost complete destruction of our banana industry, banana fields, sorry, this support will go towards rehabilitation of fields, improving drainage, improving farm irrigation, farmer training and certification, pest and disease control, and lessening the dependence on agrochemicals. However, beyond, beyond these traditional project activities and productivity enhancement, the government will now place strategic emphasis on the marketing of bananas. While we will continue to strengthen relationships with traditional markets along with partners like Export St. Lucia, we will also seek our new partners and markets. This strategy is to eliminate over-reliance on one market and build resilience in the, sec the industry. However, the challenges experienced by banana farmers didn't end with Hurricane Elsa. The Agriculture Minister Honorable Alfred Prosper was prompted by a letter from the ripening Company Fives to head a fact-finding mission to the United Kingdom to address the company's concerns about the status of bananas being shipped to the UK from St. Lucia. In addressing concerns over the future of the industry, Banana farmers have been tasked with the responsibility to ensure they produce the very best quality fruit for export. Indeed, no amount of intervention from the government of St. Lucia or the Ministry of Agriculture could compensate for substandard bananas reaching our esteemed export markets. With over 600 farmers directly involved in banana farming, the banana industry continues to play a significant role in improving the livelihoods of St. Lucians. The supermarkets are saying to us that this is a business. It is not about a hobby, it's a business. And they have to make a profit, just like our farmers must make a profit. But we cannot continue to supply the supermarkets with poor quality bananas if our farmers have to survive in this industry. Our engagements got to the point where Fives and Sainsbury indicated to us that they are not ready to sign a new contract with us by February next year unless we indicate to them that we are serious about ensuring that we produce the right quality and not just the right quality but consistent seen quality so that our bananas can meet the requirements of the supermarket. Looking at the small share that we occupy in the market, we must understand that St. Lucia's bananas, if we do not raise the standard in terms of quality, they will simply shut the door on us. But there is still a small window open for us. Sainsbury is saying to us that 
We need to have an action plan on bananas. We need to have a strategy on bananas. And it's only when they are satisfied that St. Lucia is doing that, they will begin discussions with us. Luckily for us, Waitrose, who is um, purchasing between 2,000 to 3,000 boxes from us, has given us some level of indication that by end of March, April, they would be willing to sign a contract with us. A task force will be established in early 2022 to design the strategy and requisite action plan to lead the banana subsector into the future, reinforcing the government's position to make agriculture livelihoods more viable. The thrust towards improving the productivity and quality of banana production in order to secure foreign banana markets will see the Ministry of Agriculture working directly with the National Fair Trade Organization, the NFTO, farmers and farmers groups to address the issues plaguing the banana industry, including quality claims incurred due to substandard fruits shipped to the United Kingdom and then discarded. What it means for us is that our growers must be more honest. I will repeat, so we need a higher level of honesty. The banana never forgets. So that small scar, the wrong clipping of the crown, or any little, little defect that you think may be hidden, at one point it will manifest itself and it will be at the point where it will cost us a lot more. Growers must continue to engage all workers in the operation of the, of, of the, um, the bananas. So from the deeper to your selector to your packer, everybody must be involved. Everybody who touches that fruit must understand the technicalities of, of um, producing that fruit and getting it to the market in one piece. As the new Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development, Honorable Alfred Prosper spent no effort in getting acquainted with the Ministry's ongoing work program, its numerous projects being undertaken, agency administration and project leaders, and the growing list of agriculture constituents whom the Ministry serves through a series of familiarization tours to key agricultural organizations and stations. One of these tours took him to communities in Sufre, where his discussions with farmers and agro-processors led him to better understand the current developments in the agriculture sector in that region. When you have people producing um, products of this nature, they need urgent support, just like our farmers that we visited in, in Derash. You have a high number of farmers, those who are producing potato, dashing, and other root crops. They are also making an invaluable contribution to food security in St. Lucia. But they are challenged by what I heard today. The road has been a serious problem many years ago. I know in the past some attention has been given to the road, but from what I gathered this morning, the road has become an, has been a major issue for those farmers in the Derash area. Now I know the government is stretched in terms of financial resources now, but we have to also understand the critical role that those farmers play in terms of food production, we have to find some way of relieving them of the situation and to ensure that we continue to encourage them to produce. The Agriculture Ministry and the Taiwan Technical Mission through the Seven Crops Project partnered with Marcy Stores to launch the Love St. Lucia Premium Corner. The Premium Corner is available at Massey Stores supermarkets across St. Lucia and will primarily promote the purchase of selected locally produced fruits and vegetables of the Seven Crops Project, which includes cantaloupes, lettuce, tomatoes, pineapples, watermelons, cabbages and bell peppers. This public-private partnership will be of great benefit to local farmers and consumers alike. We remain fully committed to working with the agricultural sector, our suppliers, our farmers, so that our customers would get the best quality produce produced locally. Our expectations for this Love St. Lucia campaign is for our local items to be our customers' first choice. We don't want it to be the only choice, but we want it to be the first choice. World Food Day celebrations this year saw the ministry partnering with the Feed the Poor Ministry to feed 100 less fortunate people in Castries. The initiative sought to promote national awareness and bring about tangible action for citizens who suffer hunger. 
and to reinforce the government's commitment to work on ensuring that every citizen has access to nutritious, affordable food. This is not a case in St. Lucia alone. It is a global problem. And this problem is one that I think we need to address as soon as possible. Because food security is one of the sustainable development goals that countries like St. Lucia sign on to. We must make efforts to ensure that every single person who exists in this country has an opportunity to be able to get at least one meal a day. In recognizing the need to adequately address the holistic development of the local apiculture industry, the Veterinary and Livestock Services Division spearheaded a national workshop on apiculture, which had the overall objective of developing an integrated apiculture industry, which builds awareness and protection of natural ecosystems while benefiting all apiculture stakeholders and participating communities. The training exercise was a collaborative undertaking with the Global Environment Facility, Jeff, the Ionola Apiculture Collective, Export St. Lucia, and the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, where attention was drawn towards identifying new apiculture techniques that ensure the apiculture industry's optimization and sustainability, as well as promoting the production of beehive products that meet international standards that our farmers in the rural parts of our Caribbean and St. Lucia have always gotten a small bite of the pie, with the majority of the value added going to the metropoles and the mother country and so on. I want to make an appeal to St. Lucia in apiculture, this must not happen. The value added along that value chain must remain in St. Lucia, and our people must become the the, the supporters, the developers of apiculture in St. Lucia. Jeff is determined to do that and to invest in the capacity development of the people and government of St. Lucia. So he's, let's remember the history. In cotton, is the same thing that happened. Sugar, bananas, and even tourism now, our economists tell us the multiplier effect is very low. So let us remember that we are developing an industry that must become managed and developed by our people. The value of honey and other hive products in Sindusha is estimated to be about 2 million EC dollars yearly, despite the fact that the local demand for honey and beehive goods is not met. The Department of Agriculture continues to urge apiculturists to capitalize on all value-added opportunities afforded to them within the apiculture subsector. In the same spirit of ecosystem protection and conservation, the Ministry of Agriculture signed on to a Memorandum of Understanding with the Ministry of Sustainable Development for a five-year Jeff South East Coast project, which will focus on ecosystem management, landscape restoration, and sustainable livelihoods on the southeast coast of St. Lucia. The Forestry Division will concentrate efforts on establishing at least one marine protected area, as well as restoration and rehabilitation of mangroves, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. Further support will also be given to farmers so that they can engage in value-added services such as agro-processing. So within the Department of Agriculture, we have three critical departments that have to work collaboratively with the Department of Sustainable Development and other stakeholders, including the local community leaders and community groups to execute and implement the project activities. So we are at the Department of Agriculture committed to making this project a success. And with the signing of this MOU, we used to formalize our commitment. And we look forward to working with UNEP, Jeff, the project coordination team, to make better the lives of every St. Lucian. The Forestry Division joined the Disney Conservation Fund in recognizing Melvin Smith, one of 20 recipients of the Disney Conservation Award, joining an esteemed caucus of passionate Disney conservation heroes who are citizens of over 50 countries worldwide. Mr. Smith identified 400 new wild plant species on the island that had previously gone undocumented. He also contributed to the restoration of the Sandy Beach coastline by growing 800 individual plants in his own nursery to help revegetate the coastline. 
The Disney Conservation Fund recognizes the dedication and hard work of individuals and groups working to conserve wildlife and protect wild places around the world. In applauding his work, Country Manager and Forest Management Advisor for the Caribbean Americas Fauna and Flora International, Adam Stuse explained that upon discovering a small mountaintop population of pencil cedar trees, an endemic species nearly extinct in the wild, Melvin cultivated new saplings through patience and a fierce determination to bring this species back from the brink of extinction. This species was recently discovered on the edge of a cliff at Pitipito. So what Mr. Smith has single-handedly done is to actually take some of this germplasm and bring it down. And now he's able to grow over 1,500 plants in a nursery. In its original habitat, there's just about 60 plants left. So that was the world, um, um, I would say, repository on that Pitipito itself. So now we are able to now grow these plants and now be able to restore the species in the wild. And now St. Lucians can be able to use this plant as a Christmas tree. And this is why we have called it the Peter Christmas tree because it is, in the past, it was used as Christmas trees. The Department of Forestry joined hands with the CIBC First Caribbean Bank to commemorate World Day to Combat Desertification and Drought 2021. This observance focused on turning degraded land into healthy land. In an effort to restore ecosystem services and integrate the ecosystem management approach, the two partners held a tree planting event in Monsitor Babono. Assessments carried out by the Department of Forestry provided evidence of overutilization of resources for livelihoods in that area, which had the potential to result in the loss of the resource base. The forest reserve was intentionally cleared for the production of charcoal and planting of agricultural crops. The activity saw the replanting of approximately 300 trees. We wanted to have something that would be uh, significant and long-lasting and something that would contribute to keeping a greener space. And um, it, it sort of fitted well with the fact that we have branches throughout the, the region in all 16 territories. And as you know, the branch, a branch, is also a part of a tree. And we thought that, um, you know, that would be a good thing to do. So we decided that um, let's do some tree planting. And so we've done that in all our territories. And, um, you know, today here in St. Lucia, and quite frankly, I think we're probably going to be the best because I think we, we have, you know, a very special partnership in that today sort of fits in with what is happening as a country and then overall with what we're doing as a, as a bank. The activity here today would bring you know, all those stakeholders, all our partners, to actually come and plant the tree. So they would actually take the tree and place it in the soil. You know, it's not like we planting and they just come in and watch. No, they actually come in to plant. And, and that is also significant because, you know, that kind of activity can be replicated, could be done, you know, in other places. Um, they can come back in the next three to six months, you know, and see the progress, you know, of what their own, their own work, you know, their own labor, they could come back and, and see. Um, and in that way, you know, when, you know, people are engaged, you know, in that way, in doing the, the practical work them, themselves, I mean, sometimes there is uh, greater um, value you know, that the place on the resources seat. The launch of the One Village, One Product campaign signaled the start of joint efforts of the ministries of agriculture and commerce to maximize the output of small and micro producers by developing products and branding that meet the standards of local, regional and international markets. The One Village, One Product concept is a comprehensive Japanese approach to building the capacity of rural communities while identifying a product that originates within the community, represents its culture, and has the potential to generate economic activities for the community. 
In St. Lucia, the project seeks to fill the gaps that exist in ensuring the successful marketing of local products. The project's pilot phase is currently underway in three communities, namely Prale, Shrizel, and Soufre. And what you find happening is that through agriculture, a lot of small and micro producers are able to sustain a livelihood. The challenge they have, however, is in their product development and sometimes in their product branding. Through the OVOP, what they are able to do is that since OVOP is a global community, that brand becomes recognizable. And persons recognize that there's a quality associated with OVOP. Is that we have looked at Prale and we've recognized that CMOS seems to be one of the lifeblood projects and products out of Prale. There are other products where we are testing CMOS. Um, in in Schwazel, we are testing the handicraft. And in Sufer, we are testing cocoa. As part of its ongoing efforts to better manage Sinusha's marine resources, the Department of Fisheries collaborated with sector agencies to conduct a two-day mapping exercise of the Canaries, Ancillary and Sufra marine management areas, a critical component in ensuring the effective and efficient management of fisheries. The undertaking ensured that fishery stakeholders and agencies in the area are better positioned to avoid and or resolve conflict between marine resource users while also protecting marine life. The department recognizes that over the years, since it's gazetted in the year 2000, what has happened is that there was a lot of institutional memory lost, of course, in terms of the zones. There are yacht mooring areas, there are recreational areas, there are marine reserves and their fishing priority areas and all of these areas have particular types of rules and regulations governing what can happen in those areas. Now very critical to that is people need to know where those boundaries are and what has happened is that we have relied more or less on uh, institutional memory, uh, landmarks to be able to indicate that but as we move towards enforcing those areas better and to have a long history or catalogue of it, it's critical that we what we call delimit these areas properly with georeference points. Another initiative was also launched in support of the Fisheries Department's marine and fisheries management efforts and to educate stakeholders on how best to balance their daily use for livelihood activities and marine conservation. The Coast Fish Project is a regional project focusing on six CARICOM countries, of which St. Lucia is a pilot country. The St. Lucia component will focus on the strengthening of the coastal and marine management areas, as well as the possibility of introducing a new marine management area. The pilot areas for the project in St. Lucia are Soufre and Labri. For the Soufre site, the Department of Fisheries embarked on a consultation with several stakeholders to bring about discourse on the day-to-day -day reality and to devise a plan of action for improved collaborative use of the marine resources. Every sector has their own um, you know, priorities, but a couple of the complaints that we have received are maybe some tension between um, the use of certain areas, whether they might be marine reserve or fishing priority areas between maybe fishers and divers or some um, you know, marine vessels may be going too quickly through different areas where other people might be present, you know. So it's just basically managing any outcome, any, any concerns that could be, that could arise. The Coast Fish Project is a spin-off of the Stewart Fish Project, which realized some milestones in St. Lucia in improving fisheries and marine stakeholder use of the island's marine resources. Meanwhile, the OECS Secretariat, in collaboration with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora CITES, hosted a stakeholder consultation and validation exercise for the Blue Biotrade Project. The Biotrade Project focused on empowering small-scale coastal producers from the OECS member states to capitalize on the briskly increasing global demand for marine-based bioresources like the queen conch and high-value algae such as sea moss. So right now what has been done, they've done a study to look at what the potential for trade and investment, export markets, etc., what it's what the findings of that study is being 
displayed today and we are getting inputs from various fisher folk and other stakeholders into that study. That's very important because as it starts with a study, it helps us understand where can we go with the industry? What, is, what are the potentials for the industry for increasing opportunities for livelihoods um, in the sector? The Ministry of Agriculture continued to take the safety of Pradia Lasne officers seriously by making the investment in procuring safety equipment to be used while on the field. The protection equipment included snake gaiters to maximize the level of protection against snakes and other hazards likely to be encountered in the wild. The unit also received expandable battles to be used as a compliance tool and defense weapons by the officers. I'm happy that we have that because every day we go out there, we encounter problems with snakes. Right? We're just lucky that nobody has gotten beaten from a snake yet. So I want to thank you, sir, again. And the minister involved at large, too, because he's part of the, the ministry for this equipment that we are going to receive this morning. And speaking of protection, the Veterinary and Livestock Services Division will follow through with the guidelines outlined in the Animal Act as part of its arsenal for controlling stray animals along the island's main roads. One final appeal was issued to cattle owners in late November, ahead of instituting the impounding of animals under the 2005 Animal Act. The additional emphasis on securing stray animals comes after months of sensitization and deliberation with farmers on the long-standing issue of unsecured animals posing hazards to pedestrians and vehicular traffic on the road network. We understand the, um, the needs of our cattle farmers. We understand the challenges that they face, especially those who um, are not landowners. And we understand these challenges. Um, we understand the need also for food security and food sovereignty. And so we have been, we have been working with them, speaking with them, discussing strategies and solutions to eliminate, to alleviate the wandering cattle and stray cattle on our highways, which also pose a, a high risk and a, pose a hazard to motorists, pose a hazard to pedestrians. They are also a hazard to um, property owners as well. Cattle owners must take responsibility for their livestock. There has to be responsible ownership, especially in the absence of land um, ownership and um, um, barriers in terms of fencing and so on, corrals. There has to be responsible ownership. We must take ownership of our animals and have them restrained, have them tethered to protect our public and also to protect the animals. So the Ministry of Agriculture is, making this, is imploring the farmers one last time, making that last appeal and serving that final notice. And in the absence of cooperation, we will, um, um, we will look at the laws available to us, legislation available, which indicates that it is an offense to have these animals wandering on the highway, posing a, a hazard to motorists and to the public. And these animals will be impounded. World Water Day 2021 was again set aside for increased awareness and sensitization of the importance of water resources to everyday life. This year, the Water Resource Management Agency, the WRMA, worked in partnership with the Department of Forestry to roll out its itinerary of activities geared towards highlighting tangible ways a citizen can support the ongoing interventions by the Agriculture Ministry to improve the accessibility of water and to encourage proper management and use of water resources. It's, uh, it's very fitting, very timely for us in this region because right now we're actually in the middle of the dry season. So it's an opportunity to let persons know at this time of year, you know, when we have the drought-like conditions, you know, the dryness, that um, the, the water resources may be affected in, the, um, in, in, in terms of the availability, you know, to, to, to consumers. So I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a time where persons need to take that into consideration and we move into some kind of conservation measures. The theme for World Water Day 2021 was value in water. According to the United Nations, the value of water is about much more than its price. 
The day's celebration was in line with Sustainable Development Goal number 6, which is aimed at achieving water and sanitation for all by 2030. In an effort to combat weather and climate shocks, such as droughts and floods, the WRMA and the Sindusha Meteorological Services have engaged hydro meteorological engineering companies to update the existing stations in Sindusha with the aim of increasing the capacity of data analysis. With the upgrading of the stations, the WRMA can improve the island's technical capacities, allowing it to better calibrate and integrate flood warning systems, improve numerical weather prediction use, and forecasts and have an overall quality management system. The benefit of doing the optimization of, of the network where we're doing the upgrade changing components that don't work, stations that don't work, is one, we're looking to standardize the network so that we have similar equipment um, from the, the similar manufacturers around the island. And two is to reduce our data gaps because every time a station stops working, that means we're not um, collecting data. And it is very important that we have continuous data in order to do the analysis that is needed. Now, with, um, under this um, optimization um, regime, what we're looking to do is to get the information, as much information as we can in real time. And that information now will be fed into early warning systems that we have up and running on island. The WRMA successfully installed three automatic flood warning stations at strategic points in Union Castries and Malgratut. It was completed as part of an initiative under the pilot program for climate resilience and in partnership with the University of the West Indies and the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology to reduce property damage and the disruption of commerce and human activities. In the event of an emergency, the real-time data received from the stations will be relayed to the National Emergency Management Organization to enable a faster, more efficient and predictable response. There are certain areas in St. Lucia, low-lying areas, which flood easily as a result of high-intensity rainfall, flash floods are experienced, and some of the our, our structures, for instance, bridges are also vulnerable. So this station will allow us to actually um, um, assess the relationship between rainfall and flows and river flows so that we could actually make these assessments for engineering designs and would also feed into early warning systems in collaboration with, uh, with NEMO. So basically when the flows, uh, the various thresholds are, are reached, um, the information will be communicated to NEMO and the determination will be made based on ground truthing, truthing on the ground and coordination with um, various local partners because um, we need also to validate, validate the, the flow levels to determine whether flooding is imminent or, or not. So this whole um, um, mechanism is coordinated by, by NEMO. So it's a combination of getting that real-time data and ground truthing with the various community partners. The Ministries of Agriculture and Sustainable Development formed an alliance to launch the Building Resilience for Adaptation to Climate Change and Climate Variability in Agriculture in Sindusha Project, which is funded by the Adaptation Fund and implemented by the Caribbean Development Bank. The Building Resilience for Adaptation to Climate Change and Climate Variability in Agriculture in Sindusha Project aims to improve the resilience of rural farm communities by increasing farm productivity, water and livelihood security, and reducing vulnerability to natural hazards, climate variability and climate change. The project's targets include interventions for water security, soil conservation and management, the integration of renewable energy practices to increase efficiency, and knowledge management and transfer to improve adaptive capacities. Honorable Alfred Prosper explained that in the face of more frequent and severe agricultural losses, such as the recent impact of Hurricane Elsa, and farmers having little to no insurance coverage, developing a resilient agriculture sector is critical. Noticeably, the project seeks to build on existing efforts, soil and slope stabilization being done by the Forestry Department under the John Compton Dam project and the IW Eco project in areas of Millet and Fonse Jacques, respectively. 
also targeted our water conservation measures to complement some of the work that are currently ongoing with respect to rainwater harvesting initiatives, increasing water storage capacity, and enhancement of irrigation systems under the Seven Crops Project and the, and the Banana Productivity Improvement Project. I wish to express, on behalf of the government of St. Lucia, sincere appreciation to the Adaptation Fund, especially to the board and all those involved in the approval process who ensured that St. Lucia was able to secure this grant. Collaboration to ensure the integration of efforts to achieve the common goal of enhancing school gardens and especially the school feeding program in St. Lucia was solidified through the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding between the Ministries of Agriculture, Education and Health. With the overarching aim of reducing hunger and improving food security in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for Poverty and Malnutrition, the program is supported by the CARICOM FAO Mexico Initiative on Cooperation for Climate Change, Adaptation and Resilience in the Caribbean. The framework of this initiative supports participating countries in their efforts to protect livelihoods, ensure adequate access to healthy foods, and ensure sustainable management of natural resources. The Sustainable School Feeding Program initiative is based on activities such as the involvement of the Educational Committee, the adaptation of adequate and healthy school meals, implementation of educational school gardens, improvement of school kitchens and storage areas, direct purchases of product from local farmers and school gardens, improvement of the national school feeding policy in St. Lucia, an assessment of the health assessment of students. Our understanding is that school feeding in St. Lucia, as elsewhere, have long been established and recognized as an important instrument in facilitating learning especially for poor and vulnerable children. Healthy and well-nourished children learn better. Representative from the Mexican Embassy based in Sinusha, Carlos Ivan Gonzalez Osuna, underlines the Mexican government's commitment to aid in Sinusha in this endeavor and deepening diplomatic ties. It is for me an honor and a satisfaction to participate in this ceremony that marks the launch of the, part of the implementation of the project on resilient school feeding implementation uh, program, which is part of the Mexico CARICOM FAO initiative, Cooperation for Climate Change, Adaptation and Resilience in the Caribbean. Recently reoriented in order to mitigate the economic and social impacts generated by the COVID-19 disease, and which has a budget of more than five and a half million US dollars, the entire, the entire, the entire initiative, uh, which benefit 14 countries in the region, including the six Eastern Caribbean states. Perhaps the most notable of improvements was the rebranding of the ministry's social and digital presence. With the redesign of the ministry's logo, a revamped official ministry website was launched with the objective of making pertinent sector-specific information, data, statistics, applications, technical and administrative support, and audio-visual productions more accessible to agriculture stakeholders. The new website has served well in having clients access a myriad of services without having to visit the agriculture offices. We saw with the old website the colors and the depiction, they were not in line with the colors internationally known to be attributed to agriculture. So we came back with the colors, you will see green and yellow featured, which are the prominent agriculture colors internationally. So our website was more in line with what is known internationally and the global standard. And also the content on the website, it features more heavily centered around the various departments, the service and product offering, and the, the content needed for persons who are engaging agriculture. Content such as the technology packs, which would feature on the website. Other information that you would need to help you through things like concessions, videos on our shows, Agriculture on the Move, you'd find that, and of course, linking that to our social media platform. These things were non-existent in the previous version of the website, so we've updated it to make it more attractive and interactive. 
Additionally, the IFAM application was launched to solve the long-standing challenge of capturing accurate and timely data on current crops and potential yields, the reporting of market data, and the production of reports on farmer produce in any geographic location island-wide. The adoption of digital technologies in precision agriculture has been adjusting the ways that farmers grow their crops and manage fields. I'm privileged to witness this new chapter of agricultural collaboration between Taiwan and St. Lucia. By introducing this new integrated agricultural information system, I found it is a sustainable, convenient, and transparent communication tool which connects the demand and the supply ends. Thus able to expand market access and income of local farmers. I believe that this technology leap will bring significant benefits to solutions through different aspects, even ad adapting to impacts of climate change and advancing food security. The past several weeks have been taken up with fine-tuning points of action on the work program of the Agriculture Ministry over the next quarter into 2022. This comes as the leaders of various departments and programs of the Ministry of Agriculture combine their efforts and resources in the hopes of closing gaps in the agriculture sector. With the facilitation of the two latest interventions on export where the Corporate Planning Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture and exports in Lucia interfaced with key agriculture exporters on the island and on climate change. The ministry has signaled the new direction of its new work program, that of increased stakeholder participation in the decision-making process on agriculture production, market access, and export. Chief Agri-Enterprise Development Officer Thaddeus Constantine says the time is rife to ensure that all decisions or actions taken to grow the agriculture economy be also supported by the experience and traditional knowledge of the constituents the ministry serves. As he explains, the ministry is on a mission to find the mechanisms to strengthen the strategy for the export of agricultural produce so that the sector can be an even greater contributor to the country's GDP. So it's a start of a collaborative effort between ministries. So normally, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture would engage the exports, exporters alone. Export and Russia would do it alone, Commerce would do it alone. So um, out of a series of meetings earlier this year, we decided that we need to work as a team and stop um, duplicating our efforts. Combine our efforts so that every um, partner knows where the industry is at and the contribution that needs to be made by that partner. So um, we're hoping that, like you said, this is going to be a breath of new life into the industry where we're going to now be able to work in a collaborative way. Instead of in silos, we will now work in a collaborative way where we have Exports and Lucia, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Commerce becoming one team. And that one team now supports the exporters to provide them with the information they need and also to correct the, the, the problems in the market in a timely fashion. Mr. Constantine says while export data, record keeping and dependable crop supply is essential to keep export of local agricultural crops stable, aligning the Agriculture Ministry's efforts to that of its partner ministries is paramount in moving the sector forward. Because sometimes the, the problems, we have the solutions, but we are not doing things in a timely, coordinated fashion. So Ministry of Agriculture would put policy in place for SPS. However, it is not communicated efficiently to Exports in Russia. And so Exports in Russia would still be working on the old protocols and the exporters would be working under old protocols. However, new protocols have been put in place to make them more efficient. So we're hoping that with this new synergy, this new way of working, interministerial, making the entire government services work as one body, would do marvels for our exporters, and we're hoping to use this model across the industry. Increasing the export of key crops and other agricultural produce requires an adjustment in how the key players work together, a commitment the Agriculture Ministry has reaffirmed in recent times. Throughout the world, agriculture remains under pressure to evolve into a more sustainable economic activity. The many initiatives undertaken over the last year, although successful, only demonstrates how much more work needs to be done to sustain the viability of agriculture food and fisheries livelihoods, 
while simultaneously creating a conducive environment in which all facets of the industry can thrive. It will take determination and persistence in the face of challenges, innovative minds that can perceive what value emerging niche agri-food subsectors can present to the current national agriculture strategy, embracing the change in times and uniting with the pioneers among us to grow an agriculture sector that we can all as solutions be proud of. From the production of high-value local products, greater market options, access to agricultural financing, adopting modern agricultural technologies, and providing incentives for all, especially the youth, to start agri-food enterprises, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security, and Rural Development believes the journey onward in 2022 will be filled with opportunities for regeneration and expansion. This has been the Agriculture Ministry's Year End Review. I am Amanda Faye Clark. Thank you so much for watching.